Okay, welcome back. It's time for lesson 14. We're going to continue with the Fourier transforms and so on. Um, I want to begin with a different way to look at the whole process. Let's, let's review what we mean by an inner product. An inner product in plain old vector notation is uh, a dot product. So we've got a unit vector dotted into some arbitrary vector. And what does that mean conceptually? It's a number that represents the degree to which a points in the v direction. So it's a component of a in the v direction. In Dirac notation, we'd write the same thing this way. But uh, in this case, we'd be thinking of a as a vector in some kind of an abstract vector space, and v as a unit vector in that space. But the interpretation would be exactly the same. It's the component of a in the v direction. Another way to look at that in the particular application of quantum mechanics is if we have a state A, a quantum state, and some sort of a basis state V, which is sort of a basis state is kind of like a, uh, a unit vector, more or less. Uh, it just is a unit vector that happens to belong to a basis, sort of like the I hat, J hat, K hat basis in Cartesian coordinates. But anyway, you'd say it's the amplitude of finding the system in the basis state V, given that the system is currently in the state A. So another way to interpret inner product is it's a measure of the amplitude of finding the system in the state V, given that the system is currently in the state A. So suppose we let the ket x represent the state of being at a location x on the x-axis, and the system is currently in the state psi, which is some arbitrary quantum state, what's the amplitude of finding the particle at x? How would you write that in Dirac notation? The answer is you'd write it as the bra x acting on the ket psi. But of course, the amplitude of finding the particle at a location x, given it, that it's in the state psi, is nothing other than the wave function. That's what the wave function means. It tells you the amplitude of being at different locations. So. Uh, the Dirac notation for the wave function is simply the bra x acting on the ket psi. Similarly, you can imagine having a ket k, which represents the state of having the momentum h bar times k. Suppose the system is currently in the state psi, and we want to know what's the amplitude of having the momentum h bar k, given that the system is currently in the state psi. Well, the analogous concept is that you take the bra k and hit it on the ket on the ket psi, and what do you get? You get k on psi, but uh, but that's what Griffiths calls phi of k. In other words, that's the Fourier transform of the wave function. So it's it's basically a different uh, bra acting on the same ket. So the ket psi is sort of an abstract concept of a quantum state. And if you hit it with the x bra, you get psi of x. You hit it with the k bra, you get phi of k. So phi of k and psi of x are sometimes called different representations of the same quantum state psi. Now here's a question. What would we mean by this? The bra x acting on the ket k. Well, using the same language we just cooked up, it would have to be the amplitude of finding a particle at location x given that it's in a state of momentum h bar k. In other words, we take a state of well-defined momentum and we write out the uh, amplitude to find a particle at different values of x given that it has that momentum. We've already done that problem. That was computing project two. That's the traveling wave function, the solution to the time-independent Schrodinger equation of a free particle. That is simply e to the i k x. Now the factor out in front, the 1 over the square root of 2 pi, I'm just going to put that there. That turns out to be the right factor for the conventional way we normalize these functions. It's, it's a process called delta function normalization, but uh, we haven't really got to that yet and I don't want to get into it today. Just suffice it to say for now that there is a normalization factor that needs to go out in front for everything to turn out consistently. And the most popular convention is that that 
that factor that shows up in front is 1 over the square root of 2 pi. Okay, so that's what we mean by the bra x acting on the ket k. So let's, let's talk about bras and kets. What I want to do is to work out a, an example and get into uh, the concept of projection, but I want to start using conventional vectors. So let's imagine we have a conventional vector a. This one turns out to be a unit vector. You can tell it's a unit vector because if you square the components and add them together, you get one. But I want to write it in Dirac notation. So in the old-fashioned i hat, j hat, k hat notation, it would be 0.8 i hat plus 0.6 j hat. I want to write that in Dirac notation just for, for fun. And so I would write that as 0.8 i plus 0.6 j, where i and j are kets. They represent uh, you know, basis vectors in this uh, Cartesian basis, I guess you might say. Now imagine we have a unit vector v which is, uh, how do I know it's a unit vector? Well, I can sum the squares of the components, and of course I get 1. It also is clear that the thing points uh, at an angle of 30 degrees below the positive x-axis, just looking at the formation of that unit vector. If I write that vector in Dirac notation, it looks like this. So it's just a different way to write the same thing. And then if I want to know what is the dot product of v and a, in plain old vector not notation, I'd write it this way. You can see that uh, the cosine of 30 is square root of 3 over 2. The sine of 30 is a half. And so we end up with a number. It turns out to be uh, almost 0.4. Notice that uh, you can also write that as the bra v acting on the ket a. That's the inner product. Similarly, I can make another unit vector. I call it u, and uh, notice that it actually makes an angle of 60 degrees above the positive x-axis, and so it is orthogonal to v. u and v are uh, an alternative set of basis vectors to i and j. That's one way to think about it. And I've expanded u and v here in the terms of i and j, but uh, you can see they're unit vectors, they're both unit vectors, and they are both uh, perpendic mutually perpendicular to one another. So they would stand in as a reasonable alternative basis. Now we can compute uh, u on a, just like we computed v on a, and in that case we get uh, 0.92. Very good. Okay, so what we really have are two separate uh, equally valid but different sets of basis vectors. We've got the ij basis and we've got the uv basis. And uh, you can expand any ket in terms of either of those basis vectors and still have a decent representation of your ket. Okay, so what's, what's it all for? Actually, there's one other thing I want to touch on. I want to talk about projection. So uh, what does the operator ket v times bra v acting on a do? That turns out that's called a projection operator because v on a calculates the component of a in the v direction, and if I multiply back with the ket v, I get a new ket that points in the v direction, but it's got a length of v on a, which means that it's the projection of a onto the v direction. So when you, when you make a bra and a ket and stick them together backwards like that, you don't get a number. What you actually get is an operator. It's called a dyad, and it has the property that it projects a, an arbitrary vector onto the v direction. Generally, the, the vectors you use to build these projection operators are unit vectors. Typically, they're basis vectors in some basis. And similarly, I could do the same thing with u. Uh, it would calculate the projection of a onto the u direction. Let's see how that turns out in practice. So um, I hope I, I don't know if you can see my cursor there or not. Let's hope so. Uh, we start with the um, with the vector a, that's the ket, and we calculate i on a. Remember a is 0.8 i hat plus 0.6 j hat, so i acting on a gives us a number, 0.8. I multiply by i hat, and I get a vector that points in the i hat direction. Notice that that's the projection of a onto the x-axis. Similarly, I can do the same thing with uh, the j bra and ket. j on a is the number, 0.6. If I multiply by j, I get a unit. I get a component of a in the y direction in this case. Okay, 
And uh, if I add this vector, the projection of a onto the x direction, to this vector, the projection of a onto the y direction, of course I get back a. And, uh, and uh, so it looks kind of like this. Now notice I can factor the a out and I get this whole thing in parentheses acting on A gives me A. That whole thing in parentheses therefore must be nothing other than the identity operator. So that's the identity. It's what I get by adding the dyads produced by combining each of the basis vectors and the basis, adding them all together, and that forms the identity. Actually that is a fundamental theorem of quantum mechanics is that you can build dyads out of all the basis vectors of any basis, add them all together, and what you get is the identity. Uh, there's a general rule that if you don't know what to do next in a quantum mechanics problem, stick the identity in and see what happens. That uh, You think I'm joking, but actually it, that works a lot of the time. Okay, so let's look at U and V. This is an alternative basis, obviously at, ang at an angle, 30 degrees, relative to the original basis and I can play the same game. V on A gives me 0 0.4. 0 0.4 times V gives me this projection of A. This is A projected onto the V direction. I can do the same thing for the U direction. And again, I can add them together to get A back again. I can factor the A out, and I can form the identity in this way as well. So you can make the identity out of the UV basis, or you can make the identity out of the IJ basis, but you, uh, you still get the same old identity. So how can I use this? Let's look. We, the, the point of all that was that I can form the identity out of dyads constructed from the basis vectors of any basis. So I can make the identity as the dyad of i hat plus j hat plus however many k hat, l hat, m hat, however many more I've got. Or I could form the identity equally well using u and v and w and how many other more basis vectors I might have. Um, in general, the basis vectors could have, uh, there could be a quite large number, maybe even infinite number, uh, get if you have a large enough space. And so another way to form the identity, or another way to write the identity, is the sum over all k of the dyad formed by the ket k and the bra k. Now what happens if, as we do in uh, our free particle quantum system, uh, where we have an, not a countable number of basis vectors, but a continuous set of basis vectors. The momenta of a free particle are continuously distributed. Any momentum is okay. There's, they're not countable. So that summation needs to be converted into an integral. So the bras and the kets uh, end up needing to be integrated over, and so we get something like the bottom expression. And uh, let's, let's apply that idea. What if I start with psi of x? You notice that's x, the bra x acting on the ket psi. And uh, I just insert the identity, okay? And, but I want to expand the identity as the integral over the k basis vectors. Notice that I could bring the psi in here, I could bring the x in here, and rewrite this as x on k, k on psi. But what is x on k? x on k is 1 over the square root of 2 pi e to the i k x. What's k on psi? k on psi is phi of k. So if I put all that in, what do I get? I get the inverse Fourier transform. In other words, the inverse Fourier transform is simply what you get by sticking the identity in between x and psi in an expression for psi of x. So that's uh, curious. We can play the same game with 5k. I can write 5k as k on psi. I can stick the identity in there. This time I'll write the identity not in terms of a superposition of k basis vectors, but in as a superposition of x basis vectors. There shouldn't be anything wrong with that. It's a perfectly good basis. So I can uh, do the same trick. And what do I get? I get k on x, x on psi. But wait, what is k on x? Well, remember, Whenever you flip the order of the arguments, or flip the order of the bra and the ket in an inner product, you get the complex conjugate of what you had before. In this case, that's going to give us 1 over the square root of 2 pi e to the minus ikx, psi of x. And that, of course, is nothing other than the Fourier transform, not the inverse Fourier transform. This is the definition of the Fourier transform. So what we see is that the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform are really nothing other than a change of basis uh, defined 
by sticking the identity into the uh, expression for phi of uh, k or psi of x. Okay, let's, uh, let's do a little demo of the Fourier transform so you can see how this calculation actually works. So this is a little demo that is similar to Computing Project 5, but the idea is to, uh, here I'll scroll down here to the important part, the, uh, the idea is to start with the Gaussian wave packet. Notice it's uh, e to the ikx minus x over sigma squared. So this is the uh, imaginary part of the phase, and this gives you a sort of a traveling wave. Uh, this is a real part of the exponential, and this means that as x gets big, the amplitude drops. So this sort of uh, gives an envelope that gets multiplied by the e to the i k x to give a Gaussian wave packet. So it's shaped as a Gaussian, but uh, where the Gaussian, uh, where x is small, it just looks like a traveling wave. So we'll see how that looks in a second. Um, what we're doing is multiplying every time I uh, I hit the up arrow when I'm running this demo, we're going to adjust k. k is going to be a number that uh, generates this uh, factor which multiplies the Gaussian wave packet, the psi function, and the factor is e to the minus ikx, where k is now a variable that's going to change as I advance through the, uh, the Fourier transform. k is the argument of the Fourier transform, so we're fiddling with k. That changes the um, wavelength of the uh, factor we're multiplying psi by, then, then we multiply phi by psi, we add them all up, that give, that's kind of an integral, and then scale it, and, uh, and then I'm going to plot what we get out um, from that sum, and uh, that thing I'm plotting, of course, is nothing other than the Fourier transform. So let's run it <coughs> and look at what we get. So this is the integral I'm doing. This is psi of x. Notice it's a Gaussian wave packet. It's uh, got a Gaussian envelope, but inside the Gaussian, it's a traveling wave uh, propagating to the right. And what I'm going to do is start with this k equal to 0. So when I start k equal to 0, oh, I've got to activate that screen. Uh, k is now equal to 0. Um, notice that uh, I'm going to get a very small integral here. I don't see a scale yet, but the but the blue is the product of e to the minus ikx and psi of x. The red is psi of x, the green is e to the minus ikx, and the blue is the product. Now if k is equal to 0, e to the minus ikx is just 1. So I'm just multiplying by 1. So notice how all the green phasors are just constant and equal to 1. And when I multiply by 1, of course, the blue arrows and the red arrows are the same. So, and, but the key is when I add up all those arrows, I, I sum all these guys, notice they're spinning around and around and around, and so when I add them up, I don't get very much. I get almost nothing. So let's advance k. So I'm going to bump k up, and notice what's happening. e to the minus ikx, of course, has the opposite helicity. It's spinning the opposite way of the red arrows, and the, uh, the blue arrows, because I'm subtracting something here. The psi, remember the psi is e to the plus ik0x times a Gaussian, but I'm subtracting a k from k0, and so the wavelength of the blue arrows, the product arrows, is getting longer. As I advance k, the product wavelength gets longer and longer and longer. It's really the difference between k0 and the k that I'm using in the, in the uh, factor, the e to the minus ikx, and notice at this point um, the green wavelength is getting close to the red wavelength and the blue wavelength is getting long because I'm subtracting off more and more. <coughs> this minus ikx is subtracting more and more so that the blue is wiggling less and less. And, if it, and as it wiggles less and less, Notice the Fourier transform is getting bigger. Now there are some bumps in here that has to do with the periodicity and the sampling, uh, the fact that we have a finite sample size, but, uh, but the main point is that this, uh, the Fourier transform is getting bigger as k advances. I'll continue to advance k, and notice uh, now the blue isn't even going through, how does it go? It's got, uh, there's like little over a one wavelength in here, 
that's counting. And there's a large portion where the arrows point in almost the same direction, and there's very little canceling. Notice there's very little canceling from that. So the Fourier transform is now getting big. If I continue to advance k, Fourier transform is getting quite large now, and notice that there it's definitely not even a full wiggle. You can kind of see it's it's doing kind of a half a shimmy in there. And as I advance k, I reach a point where it doesn't wiggle at all. There is no variation in the wavelength. This is when k is equal to k0. When k is equal to k0, the e to the minus kx and the e to the plus ik0x, they cancel. And all I have left is a Gaussian. Notice the blue arrows just look like a pure Gaussian. I can get it there. Now it looks like an absolutely pure Gaussian. The Fourier transform is now at its peak. Okay, that's where that's the wavelength where most of the energy is. Of course, there was there was some here at uh, shorter wavelengths, or excuse me, longer wavelengths, short, smaller values of k. As I advance k further, <coughs> now it's going to start to wiggle again. The Fourier transform comes down, and you can see the width of the Fourier transform has to do with the range of k values over which the blue arrows didn't really uh, uh, rotate very much in the region of space where they were large. Okay, As k gets bigger, they rotate more, they're canceling each other out, and now we're not getting very much. So um, that's the way that integral works. It's, uh, it's simply by, by multiplying by e to the minus ikx and integrating, we're getting an estimate of how much of the wave packet is constructed f from that particular wavelength. And, uh, and that's how it goes.